Good afternoon. We're going to shift gears. I feel no pressure since I'm the only person here to give a talk wholly dedicated to hyperacusis, where I'm not talking about a subcategory of tinnitus. I'm not talking about anything related to tinnitus at all. It's only about hyperacusis. What's life really like with hyperacusis? And I am the president of uh, the only nonprofit dedicated to hyperacusis, Hyperacusis Research. So my agenda is to talk about the patient's reality, the patient's visit, and the patient's future. And I'd like to start with David's story. For many years, I enjoyed a busy life with an interesting career working as a contractor for the federal government, running half marathons, and socializing with friends and family. Then beginning in 2013, hyperacusis gradually started setting in. At first, just an occasional noise seemed too loud. Then the sounds of an ambulance, fire engine, became painful. When riding the subway became too much, with screeching brakes, I, I realized that uh, I needed to seek help. I saw several ENTs who could find nothing wrong to treat, and they advised me just to live with it. Unfortunately, it continued to grow worse to the point where simple household sounds, such as clinking dishes and even the tearing of envelopes, became painful. In 2015, I decided to take action instead of just living with it. I did extensive research and learned about tinnitus retraining therapy. Dr. Paul Jasterboff operates a small clinic in Columbia, Maryland, which is near my house. He provided me with ear-level sound generators and counseling. He also tested my LDLs, which were in the mid-80s. Dr. Jasterboff felt that after about two months of TRT, I would feel dramatically better, and after a few more months, I should reach 100%. With great optimism, I followed the protocols and used the ear-level sound generators during the day and a white noise machine at night. However, the pattern of gradual worsening continued, and I did not improve. After six months, the sound generators began to cause ear pain, even at the lowest setting, and I was forced to discontinue the treatment. By the end of 2015, it became difficult to leave the house except for necessary errands such as grocery shopping and doctor appointments. I could not work or socialize. In early 2016, I again consulted with two different ENTs to determine the cause. They had no ideas. By this point, my LDLs had decreased to the mid-60s. I learned of an experimental surgery for hyperacusis called round and oval window reinforcement surgery, which had helped a number of patients. I underwent the procedure in August of 2016. And while the surgery had helped many others, it did not improve my hyperacusis. Now it is the summer of 2017. The hyperacusis has stopped worsening, though it bottomed out at a fairly miserable level, and I would guess my LDLs are still in the mid-60s. But other symptoms have worsened, including tinnitus, earfulness, and ear pain. The ear pain usually persists 24-7, and it's not correlated with noise that is experienced by other patients. This condition has been completely life-altering for me, and every hour of every day is a challenge. In terms of my noise history, I'm 50 years old and led a relatively quiet life. My job has always been in an office environment. About a year before my hyperacusis started, I did suffer a moderate blow to the head. As a teenager, I mowed lawns several times a week without ear protection, but when I went to concerts, I did wear earplugs. I look forward to breakthroughs in research that will enable me to resume interacting with the world again. I especially miss seeing my four-year-old niece, Zoe, and I'm trying to do what I can personally to help make this happen. Every time someone joins a new face, a Facebook support group for hyperacusis, I ask them to complete the Sanford Research Course Survey for hyperacusis. So far, I've asked over 1,800 people, and as a result, the number of completed surveys has ne nearly tripled. I also created a fundraising campaign for hyperacusis research, which wrapped up this spring and raised over $12,000. I met David for the first time at an ATA support group in DC uh, a few months ago. Tremendous, uh, tremendous person. David represents the kind of patient I'm here to speak about, and those are hyperacusis sufferers who experience severe pain with noise. It's often described as a knife in the ear. I first presented this concept at the Association of Research for Otolaryngology in 2013, which is the first time in that forum there was ever a workshop dedicated to hyperacusis. 
These patients uh, always experience ear pain with varying levels of sound. Most have sought treatment with standard clinical met methods, such as you've heard about today, and they do not work and have not worked for many of these people. Most are trying to use all available resources to improve. They're not clinically depressed. Uh, they may experience very ex difficult situations emotionally, um, but they're eager to get on with their life. Most know the research very well. They're very up to date on the, the latest research uh, among the basic uh, ear research scientists. Next, I would like to read about the patient's visit to an audiologist. The audiologist's website said he treats hyperacusis, so I was hopeful he would be different from the others, who had no idea what I was talking about when I mentioned noise-induced pain. The 50-mile drive had already started a mild burning in my ears. I opened the squeaky door into the waiting room, only to find a parent with a crying infant. I approached the desk where the staff were busy with office work, answering ringing phones, stapling papers together, typing on clackety keyboards. Someone's cell phone rang. Once I sat down, I saw an office worker feeding a shredder just in time to plug my ears with my fingers. Outside the office, a lawn crew arrived with lawnmowers. At this point, I was feeling assaulted by noise, so I put on my industrial earmuffs. After about 15 minutes, I was taken back to the audiologist's exam room, which initially seemed quieter. But when the audio audiologist came in to greet me, he slammed the door behind him. His speaking voice was loud, so I requested him to keep it down. Sorry, he said, this is how I talk. I inch my chair as far away as possible. The exam found nothing wrong with my ears. My hearing test came out what is defined as normal, though with a clinically insignificant noise notch. At this point, my ears were burning, ringing, and full. Next, he said he wanted to determine the loudness levels that I find uncomfortable, so he completed, proceeded to do an LDL test. I found it difficult to make any objective judgment since my ears were already hurting from the noises I had just been exposed to. The audiologist said that I needed not to worry about everyday noises since they can't cause harm. Although he never asked what everyday noises I was exposed to, he never mentioned the importance of the duration of noise. He said that everything less than 85 decibels is safe, but I don't think he had read the CDC or NIOSH communications clarifying what should be considered safe noise levels for the public. While NIOSH recommends an occupational standard of 85 decibels for workers over an eight-hour workday, even though 8% of workers will get hearing loss at that level, they referred to an EPA report which recommended a 70 decibel 24-hour time-weighted average for environmental noise for the public. In other words, 85 decibels isn't the safe magical limit for healthy people, let alone people with hyperacusis. No audiologist I, I visited ever mentioned the risk of, of sound at 70 decibels or above. He also never mentioned how easily one can monitor sound level exposure with a trustworthy sound meter app, such as the one NIOSH recently released and recommends for better hearing health for the public at large. I asked the audiologist if he knew why sounds could create pain. He said maybe it was an overreaction for a fear I had developed uh, for sounds like the one that caused my hyperacusis. I asked him if he had read the research by Paul Fuse, Charlie Lieberman, and others that are uncovering certain nerve fibers in the inner ear that carry pain signals. He didn't say if he was familiar with the work, but indicated it wasn't important since my problem was an anxiety I had developed about loud noise. I drove home in pain, slept for three days, and woke up to worsen symptoms. I returned from this visit worse than ever. While this story is fiction, it was developed from the hundreds of real stories I've heard. I'm sure it doesn't represent anyone here as you're all seeking to be educated. Uh, but there are, unfortunately, a lot of patients who go through some of these experiences, and the collective story makes up this story. I think the opportunities for us in the cl clinical world is to ask these questions. What kinds of accommodations do you make for a hyperacusis sufferer when you know one is coming to visit? Have you ever measured the sound levels of your office during busy times? Are you aware of what might help improve the visit for uh, a person with hyperacusis, such as not scheduling at a time when there are going to be young children present? Are instructing your office workers certain activities not to do during the hyperacusis visit uh, in the waiting room? 
Are you aware of what the real safe noise levels are for the public? Or do you quote that 85 decibel level without any context about length of exposure and the, the risk for damage even at eight, uh, with 8% 8 of the people getting injured by an 85 decibel exposure over eight hours? And how do you keep up with the latest research on hyperacusis? It's very easy now to get trustworthy research information and understand what's going on in the field of research. If a sufferer who has had a persistent condition comes to you and they know more about the research than you, why are they going to seek any help or trust that you're going to be able to provide them with something when they know more about what's going on with the research? So it's very important to be up to date on the basic science that's going on. We're, uh, we're doing a lot to help promote uh, what I see as a very positive future for patients. Because the future for patients is up to all of us, and I believe uh, most, the most important aspect for that future is that we do get at the underpinnings of what underlies hyperacusis with pain. What are the specific mechanisms? And therefore, I think the patient care will be best served when you take that latest science into account. Patients can have the best options themselves when they're also empowered uh, with that research. And I'm going to close uh, on, in focusing a little bit on some of the things we're doing to see that happen. First of all, we've got a roadmap to a cure. And this was uh, modeled off of the tinnitus roadmap to the cure for ATA, where we're we're focused on getting research funded that is helping to identify the potential mechanisms for hyperacusis with pain, elucidate those mechanisms, and then look to see how we can translate that to clinical improvements and guidelines for a cure. To accomplish this, uh, our nonprofit is raising money to directly fund research grants. Uh, some of these are clinically focused, most are basic science focused. We've raised over $140,000 in about six years have administered five grants through a partner with the Hearing Health Foundation, the first of which uh, uh, Dr. Tyler uh, was able to have to do the most extensive literature review ever done on hyperacusis that's readily available in AGA uh, and has a lot of good background context if you're not familiar with the science. One grant we funded uh, was for uh, a Harvard Mass Ioneer uh, postdoc, uh, Zian Gang who's uh, looking at uh, hyperacusis mechanics, specifically related to the one disorder of superior canal dehiscence and its uniqueness. Um, an exciting thing about the work there in Mass Eye and Ear is they are including hyperacusis as part of their mission. They were just awarded a $20 million donation from an anonymous donor. And in their press release, they highlighted that in addition to hearing loss and tinnitus, this funding will go for hyperacusis Specifically, hyperacusis is defined as a painful hearing sensitivity. With this growth in funding comes more publications. As we know, the science is not going to happen without publications. That's an indicator of how fast the science is, is developing. We've seen a doubling of that. And more importantly, the NIDCD funding has increased in recent years to $1.8 million in the last year. We're excited by that, but that's a st still an extremely low number. As those who participate in uh, clinical or basic science research knows, uh, lower level grants start at several hundred thousand dollars, uh, typically for big projects. In order to ensure that we can grow uh, the nature of fundraising capability, we're trying to educate the public about this phenomenon. Uh, starting in 2014, we were excited to get on the, the show ABC's 2020 program with uh, a program dedicated to the problem of hyperacusis in a couple and another person. Uh, that year was really big on building from that to have local channels cover it, the New York Times and BuzzFeed articles highlighting the condition. Uh, that really helped propagate uh, a much bigger awareness in the public at large. Uh, most recently, the New York Post featured an article on uh, this waitress who's also aspiring to be a model who unfortunately got the condition by a punch in the jaw. It's a fairly uh, rare way to get it, but I have heard of other cases. Um, a lot of symptoms, unfortunately, 
uh, evolved in Katrina's life from this, but hyperacusis is the most debilitating, and she became homebound uh, as a result. The best data I know of in America to get some idea of how many people have hyperacusis is from the National Health Interview Survey, which was last done extensively in the auditory realm in 2014, where this question was asked, do everyday sounds such as a hairdryer, vacuum cleaner, or a lawnmower seem uh, too loud or annoying to you? 6% answered yes to that question, uh, as published on the uh, NIH, NHIS website. However, there's a lot more data to be uncovered in that uh, survey that's never been mined to be published yet. Uh, it's an opportunity for students or others who want to go and mine that data. We got it ourselves and did our own analysis because some follow-on questions that are very important are there. And the, the, most, the second most important question was, how big of a problem for you is this in your life? 31% uh, of those said it's a moderate to a big problem, and those are the people I would say likely have hyperacusis. That would be 2% of the overall population. Additionally, 71% of those who sought treatment did indicate they had some form of pain from sound. Now I'm looking for two volunteers. I'm gonna run a, a quick experiment. So I need uh, just two volunteers uh, to come up. So um, anybody? Okay, one. Volunteer one, you don't know what I'm going to make you do, so that's very brave. Uh, but you'll have to do the hard part since you're first. Now, the second volunteer, your job is easy. So who's a, a second volunteer? Okay. So um, in order to help understand this problem with pain, you have one sim simple objective. Now, do you have a sensitivity to skin? Like if I pinched you like that, is that going to bother you? Or? No. Okay. It's not going to make you have, I don't want to get in trouble with my experiment. So you. your job is to pinch him. Okay, are you okay with that? This, this. I got the little pinch <laughs> oh, Okay, but you're only gonna pinch when I say the word pain. Okay, so I'm gonna show our data, um, and every time in that data I say the word pain, you pinch him. Now your job is to count the number of times I, that you get pinched. Okay, and your job is just to pinch, you got it? Okay, I've never tried this before, so this is exciting. Um, okay, so first of all, um, we uh, are excited that uh, we were able to uh, get a registry created with Sanford uh, that runs a coordination of rare disorders uh, out in uh, South Dakota, and uh, this registry for hyperacusis uh, now has been completed by around 200 people. This data is from about the first 125, and um, it's available for anyone who has an approved IRB for patient-centered care to acquire the data for free. Uh, so I highly encourage anybody interested in getting this data and doing analysis. It'd make a great project program for students uh, to get this data. And so it's been answered by this uh, age-distributed uh, population, which is very broad. And I'm gonna just close with a, a couple of the key questions related to pain uh, in the survey. So how did the onset of the condition start? Uh, slightly more than half, gradually, uh, the next level was suddenly. And then on the pain-specific questions, in the past 12 months, approximately how often has the participant experienced pain in one or both ears? Every day, the vast majority, the second most was continuously. That means 66% of this population, it's continuous or daily pain. When the ex participant experienced ear pain, was it the result of being around a new loud sound? Uh, the vast majority, yes. It's new sound exposure in their life that's creating a new uh, set of pain. When did that pain start from that new event? Immediately the vast majority, although some have a delay of a few hours to a day. What type of pain? I showed the knife in the ear, that's the stabbing pain. But there's an even distribution of those who talk about burning, dull ache, or other types of throbbing pain. When the participant experiences ear pain from environmental sounds, how long does it last? So that, that new onset, when, how long is it gonna be before it settles down? The number one answer is several days. That's from a single new noise exposure, walking by a lawnmower, walking, being in the bathroom, getting stuck downstairs with someone pressing that uh, hand dryer. 
that one new exposure could create pain to last several days. That's the number one answer. For many, it's uh, up to 24 hours. This is a good question to find out. The things I'm going through for your patients, these are questions that would be great on intake forms. Because if your patient's experiencing this level of severity, which is on the severe side, then your treatment approach needs to account for these types of factors. Um, how often does a participant have a setback that makes their condition worse? Several times a year are all the times the number two answer. What do we mean by a setback? It's some new exposure exacerbates the, the condition on a sustained basis. Um, so finding out if the patient had a recent setback, are they at what would be considered baseline? Like, are you today how you've been the last few weeks or the last month? No, a week ago, I, I was exposed uh, to an extra sound. When the participant experiences a setback, is it moderately worse? Uh, that's the majority. And how long does it take to recover? Several days for most. What creates that new setback? Loud noises from sirens, motorcycle, planes is the number one answer. OK, so how many times were you pinched? I think 12. You think 12? OK, and what do you think would have helped you to not feel pain from that pinching? <laughs> oh! <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you so much for volunteering. I appreciate the volunteer. So, so uh, to conclude, you know what I the point I'm making is hyperacusis with pain is a unique category. I think it, it takes a lot of unique considerations when treating patients with this dimension, and you really want to understand not all hyperacusis sufferers have that. Uh, right, there are other types of just loudness hyperacusis, annoyance hyperacusis, but if they have this, you're going to have a lot of factors to consider, and this gives some opportunities. To learn more, we have a newly formed hyperacusis alliance. You can see me about that, and um, I hope that you can take away a few key messages that uh, you know we are unfolding new science on a very fast pace now compared to the past to get at the mechanisms. We don't have them yet. We have a lot of ideas. And I think that's going to offer a lot better options for these types of sufferers.